Beautiful. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. A warm welcome to Raw Talk Lockdown Conversations. Today, I've got an awesome guest, uh, a young man that I've known for a number of years and truly an amazing prospect um, when it comes to youth leadership, leadership in general, but also someone that is a specialist in a particular field called entrepreneurship. Um, his name is Tatu Mukwena. He is currently a PhD student. He does some consulting work with, uh, with uh, organizations like Nissan. Um, and then secondly, he also is a lecturer at the University of Pretoria. So Tato, a big warm welcome to Lockdown Conversations. Thank you for having me, Fadi. Thank you. It's great to have you and great to see you again, my friend. Um, Wonderful, yeah. Yeah, just to kick off the conversation, how have you experienced the lockdown personally? Um, yeah. Uh, well, Ferdy, the whole world had to make some drastic changes. I mean, in terms of this, the restriction and the fear that has been going around. But on, in, a, in a professional setup, you know, the first thing, the obstacle that we had to deal with is working from home. You know, many organizations are used to the whole traditional setup of going to the office, having office hours, but the idea or the prospect of fully working from home is, was a bit of a challenge for myself and is a bit of a challenge as well for some of my colleagues. All of a sudden, the infrastructure that maybe took your company a couple of years to set up, you have to set up at home. Your internet connection has to be good at home. Suddenly, your phone, you need to have a dedicated phone for your clients, you know, the home environment as well. If you have kids, you have to create that space, that professional space, and it's difficult if you have toddlers. For example. I don't have them yet, but it was a bit of a challenge. But fortunately on my side, uh, my organization has already been working uh, towards remote access because oftentimes we have to do some consulting work for places which are at a distance. And for us to do that, we have sort of had to invest in some of these infrastructures and it, it was a little bit easier than what I would say the rest of the businesses were facing, yes. The biggest challenge, obviously, was to transition from work because the, the, the office space in itself changes your mindset. The moment you get into the office, you get into work mode. But to get into work mode with the confines of your home, that's a different challenge altogether. After, after some weeks, you get used to it. Oh, that's good to hear, Matt. So tell me, obviously, you're working mm. in the university space. And um, do you think the university in general, and not necessarily the University of Pretoria, but the universities in South Africa, mm. do you think they were geared for, you know, this whole um, thing that happened in, in society, you know, in terms of being prepared, like you say, they... There has been long distance learning, you know, going on for a number of years. Mm. But do you think they were fully mm -hmm. prepared for what was to come? Um, the so on-site universities, they were not prepared because much of the infrastructure is on, is on the campus itself. Uh, because they've taken into consideration a large number of the students don't have access to the internet at home or they don't have access to devices that are suitable for doing assignments and whatnot. So yes, if you live in a residence, you will have an IT lab. If you are on campus, you can access the facilities and the programs that are needed to do your respective courses. But as of now, the biggest challenge is now, what about some student who maybe lives in the most remote place in the Eastern Cape? They might have internet access, but some of the platforms and the software that you need to do your assignments might, look be, might not be conducive for your phone. So it's a big challenge for them because like right now for me, from an educator's perspective, I had to make some considerations now in terms of what software am I going to use to deliver my lectures? Because some, some software, I don't have the benefit of um, making some deals with some network providers to provide it for free. So I, the idea is, if all the lectures are going to be online, can you imagine the internet bill of a poor student? I mean, 
No one, I don't think students can afford to have 50 gigs dedicated just for lecturing. So we're trying to have this, um, to set up our website in such a way that anything that you need from school or if, with regards to my module, if you log onto the internet and you're able to get to the UP website, you're able to get it for free. But there, there's a, there's a, if you, if you choose one platform, you forfeit some of the benefits of another. But at the end of the day, we have to have the mindset of accessibility. I want everyone to be able to access my course free of charge. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So um, in terms of the effect, um, I think you already addressed it a little bit in terms of the effect mm. that it has on, the, on your occupation and your business. Let's talk a little bit about the entrepreneurship mm. component of it. You know, um, do you right. see, do you see, um, you know, I always say that in, you know, the biggest challenges, there's the biggest opportunities. Um, from an entrepreneurship point of view and you being in that space and sort of cult, you also in the, you know, you're an entrepreneur yourself, mm. but then also you are cultivating mm. entrepreneurs for the future. Um, do you think mm -hmm. there is, or what have you seen in terms of entrepreneurship, things that are opening up within, you know, the economy in that space, even during a time of, you know, absolute distress? Okay, well, you know, there has been this buzz, especially amongst the entrepreneurs, that they were anticipating or seeing that things are moving towards e-commerce, but in the South African culture, especially especially in the SME space, there was a little bit of distrust from maybe the people who are living in the township, distrust to make some transaction online. You know, most people are used to seeing the physical product and making transactions hand to hand, but due to some of the restrictions that are now imposed due to COVID-19, a lot of people had to look for different ways to, to deliver their value or to even make a customers aware. Yes, there has been a slight improvement in terms of online activity from the general population, but that activity has went from just evaluating products to possibly making purchases online. And that integration of clients as well, they've started to integrate that e-commerce ability, you know, the ability to just make that purchase transaction online. And then this has forced them to also integrate themselves with the bank. Because if you, if you read up on the informal economy, a lot of businesses don't necessarily want to use the bank. I'm talking about the very small and micro businesses here. Mm. They prefer operating the shadow economy. The shadow economy doesn't necessarily mean that they are doing illegal activities, but their activities are not regulated and they're not seen by the taxmen or the banks. So there's no electronic trace. But in today's day and age, I mean, in today's situation and circumstance, they are forced to do that because the bank provides that trust. It provides that security, not just for the one who's buying the product, but for the one who's selling as well. So that transition for me, I found it very interesting. You know, that adoption of e-commerce or towards e-commerce. They've been thinking about it when they were consulting with me, but they had a little bit of uh, uh, concerns because the, the population were not really taking that. They really wanted to go to your business, but you can't. Right now, you cannot do that. You know? And now, it provided opportunities to me to say now, how, what is the best method for you to present your product or to, to actually make the customer aware? How do you even reach that customer? You know, just putting an ad on Facebook. Facebook might seem like, well, it's making its revenue of advertising, but is that specific to your target market? That's a very important consideration that they had to make. So yes, people are becoming more and more connected. Strangely enough, physically isolated, but virtually more and more connected. Sure, Yana, yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Yana, yeah, no, I think um, all of us has to, you know, we've, we've had to make a, a lot of decisions with regards to um, how we approach online. You know, I'm myself, I, I, I won't necessarily say that I'm a, uh, a, a pro technology individual you know i i tend to like the the physical interaction between people and that's my line of work but on the other hand i've seen within in within the raw movement i've seen the the benefits of you know making use of online 
mediums to to extend your reach and to um you know just maybe sometimes just a supplementary platforms that you know c you can help develop others so my my, my next my next question is is um do you think that you know education when it comes to entrepreneurship um i know we're talking a little bit about the entrepreneurship side of things now but do you think education is going to be adapted in the in the in the near future when it comes to educating the youth um because uh, it's somehow some way it feels a little bit that uh, again education whether it's from a basic education point of view or a tertiary education point of view um it feels like south africa is that step behind when it comes to fully utilizing you know the virtual space do you think do you see things changing in that arena i think so um specifically uh for the youth why it's because the youth are, are much more connected than their parents to the internet i mean the youth use the internet as a place where they express some of their freedoms their opinions you know some of their ideas they cross fertilize within the internet space now sooner or later you know since this is the, their main platform to go sooner or later some of the ideas of how to resolve some of the problems that they are facing in their local community they will happen by the internet i mean we don't have to think about it too far think these things are already happening these conversations are already happening on whatsapp groups you know when the youth get together they realize okay i have a metric but i don't have the funds to go to university all right and somehow i have to contribute towards the household income already in that situation they might be pushed into entrepreneurship but a lot of the youth are they realize that they don't have necessarily have the resources to embark on, a, on an entrepreneurial venture by themselves so they join these entrepreneurial forums and not and the government even um, promotes that they form corporations but when they get together the, like that and discuss some of these ideas all of a sudden a mountain which was insurmountable all of a sudden they can now start to mix up some of their own individual resources and individual perspectives and experience and their qualifications and their skills and they can tackle this problem they can tackle this problem without even meeting physically they just have to have an area of interest. and if you look at the um in terms of now this education if you look at the internet space right now the, the 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 infrastructure behind the internet is improving i'm talking even about the fiber optics that's making internet much 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 more quicker we are heading towards that stage where engagement between you who is somewhere else and me who is here to become seamless i mean this platform which is zoom platform or google meets or blackboard what not they are creating this culture right now they're creating the culture whereby people are able to engage with the rest of the world at real time and have meaningful conversations so i do think we are moving towards that phase for universities who have invested in lecture rooms and what not i don't think even if we move to level 1 i don't think they are going to let go of this these competencies that they are going to build during this covid period i definitely think to some degree uh, for for precautionary measures for the future they're going to have a, 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 la, a certain percentage of their uh, tuition dedicated towards the online platform just to see because it will it will help them as well to extend you know a university right now can maybe lecture 50,000 students a year but yeah. the moment you are able to online experience uh, feasible all of a sudden you can now have 150,000 students from all around the world it's going to happen with the entrepreneurs as well where i see where i see an opportunity right now there is a huge opportunity for a uh, business leaders especially in south africa who can now give mentorship classes because that's the best way to learn as an entrepreneur it's not from a book but is to see someone who is in business in action all of a sudden all of a, all of a, a sudden the business leader has a phone has internet connection and they can walk a thousand people through some of the challenges 
or some of the opportunities that they go through in their own respective business. It's something that I don't think some the, uh, the leaders have investigated, but it's something that's going to happen in the near future. Mm. Yeah, that is very true. I like that a lot. Tell me, Dr. Like, um, entrepreneurship, do you think anyone can be an entrepreneur? Um, the reason why I ask you this is because, and I think mm. you, touch, you touched it on, you touched on it um, just now with it when you when you referred back to the to the business uh, leaders. Um, mm. I really believe that you know anyone can start a business, but an entrepreneur mm-hmm. is something different. You know, it's a different yeah breed. I can go yeah. deeper into that. Yes. yes, I can definitely go into that. Please, I often time. I have to explain to some of my clients because uh, what happens is our I, as, as a client, as a as an consultant, will try to push people into the field of entrepreneurship. But unfortunately, the field of entrepreneurship has its own ups and downs, and you need a certain kind of character or personality to survive in that. You know, there's a big difference between a business owner and an, an entrepreneur. A business owner, their main speciality is managing their business processes. You, know, you simply just need to learn how the process works and you maintain it. The idea is you, want, you don't want any fluctuations between your profits. That's what a business owner does. So if I, get, if I inherit a tax shop from my dad, I don't have to be an entrepreneur. I just need to learn how, what was he doing to make sure that the business continues. I do some adjustments here and there, but nothing new there. Entrepreneurs are different because entrepreneurs are in love with a problem mm. which now eliminates a large percentage of humanity humanity they we live in a in a world of instant gratification and so albert einstein once said he said i am not the smartest man in the world i am the man who spent the most time with the problem mm. which is exactly at the core the ethos of an entrepreneur something bothers them so when people come to me, young people especially, they say, Tato, tell me which business to start. It is wrong for me to point them in a direction because I have to make sure that whatever problem they want to solve is problems that matter to them. Because in that time, in that period when you're not making money, what's going to be the motivation for you to continue to providing the service or to continue to improve the service to get to a level where it is meeting the need? You have to care about the problem. Um, you study Mr. Musk, for example. Mr. Musk, yes, we call him a serial entrepreneur because the businesses that he started, they started with something that irritated him. At mm-hmm. one point, he wanted to do a transaction and he couldn't do it. He started PayPal. Then he started to wonder about the world, whether the future of modern civilization, whether we we're going to become extinct or not. He started his space company. Then he had a problem with the current offering or the, by then the current offering of the electric vehicle space, he started his own. So that's the, in the, if I talk to someone and they don't have a problem, nothing irritates them about the world. And I mean, nothing bothers them to a point of action because anyone can be irritated from a distance and complain. But if that thing that irritates you wants you to do something, you have an entrepreneurial spirit. And mm. right now my studies are on entrepreneurs that are social entrepreneurs. Mm. People tend to think something in the social space, you're not necessarily an entrepreneur, but the idea is that it's just the social problem that is causing you to move into action. And you're going to need some of the entrepreneurial skills to make sure that that intervention is a going concern. Mm. Different from a non-profit entity, because a non-profit entity is waiting for a government or whichever company to sponsor them, and then they simply disperse the funds accordingly but a, a social entrepreneur is profitable but the main reason why they are profitable they want to see the social ill be addressed all the time but again they must be in love with that so i push love among the youth especially i say no don't think about all the problems think about the problems that really bother you mm. Sure, that is amazing I'm... that's my that's my definition like here. i can i can i can feel like energy when you speak about it i can i can i can feel the passion that you have with regards to it and i like having having started a business i've 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 said to many people i said to them there is a difference Mm. between an entrepreneur 
and a business owner. A business owner, once, once a business owner, um, you know, runs into trouble, they might just go and start another business. But a, a, a entrepreneur, entrepreneur sort of has that, that spirit. And like you say, it is a spirit. It's, it's something that they caught somewhere along the line, whether it was a problem mm. or something close to their heart. And they are sort of almost, you know, and Elon Musk is probably a good example of it. You know, mm. he is willing mm. to lay his life down for that cause. And, um, and I yeah. think if we talk about entrepreneurship in South Africa in particular, um, mm. we need to, we need to um, show this to the youth, especially to say to them, you know, if you, if you want to call yourself an entrepreneur, Make sure, mm. like you say, you fall in love with that problem that you're trying to solve and that you are willing to sacrifice basically everything to meet and solve that yeah. problem. You know what, they, what people don't realize right now is when you're an entrepreneur, as, as, as um, in comparison to a business owner, when you're an entrepreneur, the business is an extension of yourself. Mm. Every one of the entrepreneurs that are world-renowned their business is exactly who they are. You think about, for example, the late uh, guy from um, Apple. What's his Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Yeah. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Even though he was an employee of Apple, the whole Apple atmosphere reflected him. He actually set the culture of the business, and that's what an entrepreneur does. Because if you if you study, entrepreneurs are not necessarily good managers. Mm. They're the v- they see where the business is supposed to go. They know how it's supposed to run. But under them, especially if you look at the organizational structure, the entrepreneur is the CEO who sees the end in mind. But the COO, the operations manager, he is someone who is not entrepreneurial, someone who knows how to put the dots and the eyes together, mm. someone who specializes in management, making sure that the available resources are used in a way that can make sure that they realize this vision. And that's the American model of entrepreneurship. You hear about a 21-year-old being uh, the CEO of a multi-billion company. It does not make sense to you. But when you study the organizational structure, you realize the actual qualified person with the MBA is the COO. Mm. This vision is the figurehead. He's what's working and what's not, to see exactly how this business can grow when this one makes sure that business stays afloat. Sure. No, brother, I think we need to have a a long conversation about this. And um, (laughs) just to the audience out there, um, Tato will be speaking at our next Roar Talk um, live event. So um, we are very looking forward to that. You know, I think... um, you know, just the energy and the passion that you have for entrepreneurship makes me very excited. Um, yeah, so in Thanks. terms in terms of um, South Africa, um, what is it that you want South Africa to learn out of this lockdown process that we've gone through? What do you see happening and what do you want South Africa to learn after, after the lockdown has been lifted? Um, there are two, two things maybe I want to highlight here. The first one is, as South Africans, we need to stop, we need to move out of this in-time reaction. A lot of the calamities that happen in the world, had we just paid to what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the US, what's happening in China, we had more or less a month head start. In certain instances, we had a year head start. I remember, for example, what happened with uh, the banks nowadays where they are retrenching a lot of people, you know. That started happening in London seven to eight years ago already. So as a third world country, we have the advantage of seeing what's happening in the first world because that wave will eventually get to us. So I, I, I urge Africans to study the European markets, the South America, wherever it's happening and it's not Africa. Have, have a look at what's happening in there and now start to localize it and see what is it that we can do to prepare ourselves from this thing that is definitely coming in our direction. Mm-hmm. The second thing 
which I find interesting is uh, uh, a lot of businesses nowadays are not necessarily in need of people with degrees, but are in need of people with skills. It is very possible for you to get your degree, to get your honors degree and to lack a skill. A skill means a, a, an ability to resolve a specific problem. So you are well equipped with the theories of how to approach a problem, but your theories that don't have the real time ability to maybe circumvent or, or to challenge whatever is challenging you back. So I urge young people to not neglect some of these skills that come naturally to them. For example, I talk naturally. It's a skill that I have that I can hold Another, another person might be very good with method, might, might, might have a mathematical aptitude. Yes, it might necessarily be exercised within your degree or qualification, but it's something that you should use already in your house, in your community to solve problems. Because at the end of the day, when, the situ when jobs are, are scarce to find, like people are being retrenched in today's day and age, the one thing they cannot retrench is a needed skill. Mm -hmm. The coding world right now, the coding world is up on the up and rise because coding is not a qualification, it is a skill. If you can code, you can code. Mm. So I'm, I'm telling, I'm talking to a lot of these young people out there to say it's good to get a qualification because yes, it will get you, it will give you that entry point into an organization, but what you make money out of and what will give you the most satisfaction is using your God-given skill that you have honed, that you have nurtured to solve problems in your world. At the, at the end of the day, I have a scale. I have a scale that I always use to illustrate how the wealth of the world is distributed. In the very low end of the scale, you can be, uh, you can be paid or remunerated for the energy that you disperse. You're a bricklayer. You are told how to lay bricks. You lay bricks all day, you're given money. Okay? And usually they're not well paid. You go a little bit higher up the scale, you might be remunerated for your time. I was doing a certain thing and I will bill you according to my time, irrespective of the output that I had in that two hours. I bill you for my time. But at the very, 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 very end of the scale are people who are paid for their opinion. Mm. Social media influencers who make money off Instagram, they are basically giving their opinion to say no, by L'Oreal, L'Oreal will work for you. They're not even experts in their fields per se, but that ability to sway opinion gives them wealth. And I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging young people to develop themselves to a degree whereby when they give opinion about anything, they are knowledgeable. They are... That's it. Sure. I love that. It's my own imagination scale. No, yes. I love it. I love it. I feel you. I definitely feel you. Lastly, brother, uh, tell me, do you have a dream for South Africa? I actually do. Tell me what uh, it is. My dream, for, my dream to, for South Africa is to see a youth that is empowered. I use the word empowered because... Uh, we have inherited, uh, as youth, we have inherited the a desolate and des destitute mindset of, let's say, uh, our parents who lived in a, in, a, in, a, in a different era. You know, still expecting the government to do a lot of things for, for them. You know, but I, I personally didn't do any marches. I didn't do necessarily. Yes, I, I, I might have. I might be affected by the consequences of our party, but I, I desire to see a youth when they think of solutions. They actually don't look at the government. They don't look at their parents. They, they look at no one else but them. I tell me, there's a part in the Bible that just says, "Arise and shine." It is not talking about your neighbor. It's talking about you. The day we get an, a, a youth, that's that's places it upon themselves and say, you know what, as for me and my generation and the generation that comes after, I have to do something to make sure that my family will be taken care of. That's what I'm looking for. Right now, right now we are in a phase where us as youth, we are frustrated. Because we might be seeing the differences in income, the differences in opportunities, but we need to evolve beyond frustration. At some point, we're going to realize that 
the government does not have the ability. Last I checked, the, in terms of employment, the government employs around about 50% of all workforce in South Africa. That's a big load. Clearly, mm. they can't employ What can we do on a local scale? Here in your community, so the day I see youth empowered, look at no one but themselves, I'll be very happy. Awesome. Awesome, and I believe, like Tato, I truly believe that you're going to play a massive role in that empowerment process. You know, I think um, something much, that I just took out of the conversation today is is the fact that you know, um, you know, we need to be problem solvers, and we need to. Uh, you know, there's there's cha- there's problems or challenges or opportunities, as I call them. You know. The, they are all mm-hmm. around us. We need to identify them mm-hmm. and we need to um, really put some heart into it and, and, and run after creating solutions for those, for those problems that we see. And the cool thing about South Africa or being part of a, a nation that is not as developed as it can be is, is there's still room for development. So we have, we've got the opportunity yes, now as, as young people um, to to meet those needs and solve those problems. Um, I just want to yes. go back quickly to the spirit again, the spirit of uh, mm-hmm. of an entrepreneur, and uh, maybe to yes. all the listeners out there, to you know, if you feel that you've got that spirit of the for, of an entrepreneur, do exactly what Tato said: is to is to find a mentor that can mentor and activate that thing inside of you. Because um, I think if I look back in terms of my um, uh, development and you know entrepreneurship journey, um, is that I there, there, there is definitely a lack of, of mentorship in, in my story. So um, I want to encourage every single one listening to say, if you feel that you've got that spirit of entrepreneurship, um, find someone that can mentor you and activate that thing um, and that can also hold you accountable because um, ultimately the ideas, the problems that you solve will have a social impact and will make our nation better. So, yeah. Can I comment on that? Yes, that please, please. This very point that you put, you know, a, a tip for young people when they are looking for a mentor because I, I encounter a lot who want to advise on that. Uh, when you're looking for a mentor, Yes, look for someone who is where you want to be. Yes, but that's just one part of the equation. Most importantly, look for someone who thinks the way you want to think as well. Mm-hmm. And there's the only way to find that out is to study their material, to look at their Facebook posts. If they have a book, read the book. If they have a raw talk, listen to their raw talk. The moment your mindset can connect with that mentor, clearly, you also will be making the kind of decisions that will land you to where he is and beyond. That is That's so it. true. Listen, Tato, this has been super inspiring for me and I, and I look forward to Thank having you very many, much, many more of these conversations with you. I think um, you have got so much value that you can add and so much depth. You know, I believe all the female listeners have fallen in love with your voice. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah look you've got so much depth and so much substance and I th- like I said I think you're going to play such a big role in activating you know the next generation whether it's an entrepreneurial thank field or just on a personal level um, so I truly mm. want to thank you for this opportunity that you've, you've given me to chat to you again um, and also, uh, you know, giving your time for, for this platform. I think the listeners will take a whole lot of value out of this. Thank you very much. Fred. All right. But um, we'll chat soon. And thank you for your time. God bless. God bless. All right.